We're good without the microphone? All right, welcome everybody to our second Master of Professional Writing faculty and student reading series event of the spring semester. Um, our special faculty reader tonight is going to be noted author Gabrielle Pina. Um, I'm Nairi Perrion, and I'm the student coordinator of the reading series. I'd like to thank Romans for graciously agreeing to host our program time and again and for their continued support of our events. Um, and yeah, and Jennifer and Connie for helping me out tonight. Um, thank you to Damon, recording in the back. Um, he's filming the evening and we'll have it posted on MPW's YouTube page. Um, so before we get started, please silence your cell phones. Um, feel free to hang out, have some refreshments in the back. Um, I know tonight's theme is lust and chastity, but they already have like Easter candy out, so sorry. <laughs> I tried to find like red and pink stuff, I don't know. Um, so like I've stated before, I wanted a cohesive theme for our reading series throughout the year, so I picked um, sins and virtues, which I feel like reflect continuity from one event to the next. Um, tonight I tried to find funny quotes about lust, but apparently nobody really thinks that's hilarious. So I found one by um, Thomas Hobbes, who said, curiosity is the lust of the mind. So I thought as literary people would appreciate that. Um, so without any further ado, um, I'd like to introduce Karen Tate, who's our first reader of the evening. Um, Karen is in her first year deciding between fiction um, for books or stage and screen. Um, Karen would feel terribly guilty if she attached guilt to pleasure. She says, go for it. Greed is her favorite virtue. It's kind of nice. If you don't really, really want all of something, how good can it be? Her best va Valentine's days were in grade school when everybody brought Valentine's for the whole class. They kind of went downhill after that. You may not know that she just became a grandmother for the second time on Wednesday, February 8th. Ladies and gentlemen, Karen T. This is called Politics, and it takes place in a very, very upscale home somewhere in Pasadena. <clears throat> okay, tell me again, because you know how forgetful I am. This is left. It's left. And left is conservative, right? No, right. I mean, left isn't conservative. Right is conservative. Oh, I get so confused. I know. Let's do a sort of speed drill. No. Please, you're fine. You know it. We don't have to do that. Oh, I think we do. Okay. Ready? Go. Left. Liberal. Right. Conservative. Left. Liberal. Right. Conservative. Country. Liberal. No. No. I'm sorry. I mean, no. Please, Louise. Honey, I'm sorry. Well, I should just think you are, my dear. I'm trying to learn here. I'm trying to find out things about the world, about how things work. And I think we're in agreement that I do need to expand my knowledge, right? Right? Ow! Yes, I mean, no, I mean, please stop, honey, please. No. I think we'll stop when I'm as smart as you are, precious hubby bubby. And this country is Iraq. Iraq, for God's sake. And this one? England, the United Kingdom. And this cutie here? B -b Bolivia. Three for three. You are phenomenal. What a man. I guess my crude little map isn't so bad, is it? And you thought I didn't know where any of those places were. I think you're in for a big surprise because I also know the names of the leaders of each country. And if you'll hold still for me, I'll just write them all out for you. No, please don't. I believe you. Please don't. No, no. Ow! Stop, please. Ow! Ow. Oh, stop sniveling. Our neighbors will think I'm smacking my bitch up. Now, we need to review the other areas in which I am deficient. Hmm. We talked about the world. I guess it's time to get back to domestic policy. Honey, Louise, listen to me. This is insane. Sweetheart, really. You know all you need to know well, about, about everything. Politics is stupid. I never should have bothered you with it. 
I was just, I, I was just showing off, trying to make myself look smart. It doesn't even matter. Believe me, please. Oh, please believe me. I'm sorry. Truly, I am. Nothing to be sorry about, my love. Well, maybe the thing at the party. You've just been mm, trying to help me all these years, trying to guide me toward my own self-improvement, my own self-interest, as it were. You've been my ally. Oops, I feel a stroke of inspiration coming on. I'm almost out of room back here. I need a nice, clean surface to write on. Mm, here's a good place, right here. I'll scream. The neighbors will come. They'll call the police. If you make students nervous when they're trying to take a test, well, gosh darn it, their pencil might slip. And who knows what might get cut. Now, you made me memorize this because you felt, and rightfully so, that my education was, well, a little slipshod. So now, I'm repaying you by showing you what I've learned. It won't take long. I'm not going to do the whole thing. Here goes. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. Don't move your leg again, dear, or I'll carve the long version. And who knows where that may end up. That they are endowed by their creator. You know, I don't like that all men thing. Some men might interpret that to mean they're somehow more equal than we are. Some men might think that gives them the right to make fools of their wives at parties, to make the whole crowd laugh at how little the little woman knows about big old intricate, hard to understand political governmental stuff. Louise, sweetie, you're much more equal than I am. You're, you're better than I am, much, way, tons better. Please let me go. Please, honey, you know I love you. Oh, pickle peppers. You're just being politically correct, see? I even know what that means now, thanks to you. Oh, I have a special one for you. But first, I'll just sharpen this. Wait, honey, wait. Stop it, stop. Let me go. Two days. I'm hungry. Please, no more. No, come back. What's two little old days compared to all these years of being humiliated? This is inhuman. Oh, so now I'm inhuman. For 15 years, you cut me to pieces and leave me bleeding in front of your smarmy friends, who I can only recognize by their aristocratic nose hairs, and I'm inhuman. I've done you a favor. You've graduated from a rich, useless piece of pseudo-intellectual fertilizer to a living work of agitprop art and a walking, well, sitting map. And a darn good one, I have to say. Damn you, Louise, don't cut me anymore. Untie me, you'll be sorry. I'll make you sorry. Oh, now see what you've gone and done? You got some of your blood on my shoe. Well, I guess that just about ruins our treaty. That's a big word, huh? Treaty? Two whole syllables? And here's another one. Weapon of mass destruction. <laughs> and I'm going to sharpen this one again, and I'm thinking... I'm thinking of liberty, Lady Liberty to be exact. What does it say at the base of that statue? Get that other leg ready, honey. <laughs> Louise, no, no, no. Give me your tired, your poor, your naked, bleeding husbands longing to be free. I lift my knife beside the kitchen door. I'm sorry, so truly sorry. All right, you want a break? Yes, yes, please, please, a break. Then a break it is. A schoolhouse rock break. I'm not singing that again. <laughs> You'll sing, or I'll carve you like a big old Christmas, Ooh, political correctness, holiday, turkey. And until then, until then, I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And I'm sitting here on Capitol Hill. Start over again. When you whine like that, I can't understand a word you say. Until then, I'm just a bill. 
Yes, I'm only a bill. Thanks, Karen. Um, our next reader is Josh Jackson. Josh is in his first year. Fiction or nonfiction, probably fiction concentration. His guiltiest pleasure is real estate catalogs. His favorite virtue is patience, but he's in too much of a hurry to figure out why. So his mother used to make and sell Valentine's chocolates. One was shaped like a phonograph and said, just for the record, I love you. For Valentine's Day, his freshman year of high school, he tried to persuade her to make one that said, just for the record, I like you, so he could give it to Ellen O'Brien. His mother instead suggested, just for the record, you're cool. Thankfully, the conversation made no further progress in either direction. And you may not know that Bromans is one of Josh's favorite bookstores. So everybody, Josh Jackson. Thank you, Nairi, and uh, yeah, Romans is one of my favorite bookstores, so thank you to Romans um, for having us here tonight. I'm, um, I'm going to read, I'm going to be fairly brief, I'm just reading a chunk from an essay that um, I've been working on in Bernard Cooper's personal essay class, um, and I've, we workshopped it last week, and I have all kinds of great notes that I haven't incorporated yet. Um, it's called, um, I was a teenage Yankees fan, and it's about, um, growing up with conflicting interests in New England. Um, I, think the, I think all you really need to know for the part um, that I'm going to read is that for a long time I was a Red Sox fan like everybody else I knew. Um, and then when I was about 10 or 11 I started reading about Mickey Mantle in New York City in the 50s and then that Christmas a distant relative showed up and he was a trainer for the Yankees and he sent a whole bunch of Yankee swag to, to me and uh, in care of my mother. Um, also, there's some foul language. Um, <laughs> the summer following the visit from the Yankee staffer, my mother's company gave away tickets to a Sunday matinee at Fenway Park. My brother and I talked about nothing else after this announcement, but we soon learned that neither my mom nor my stepfather would be able to take us. My parents had divorced when I was three, and I knew my mother would not ask my father to go in her place. She likely, and not unreasonably, believed we would be safer on our own. She was a credit manager at a business that sold plumbing supplies to contractors, and she must have figured she could trust a couple of the plumbers who were going on the trip. A few months ago, my mother, apropos of nothing, said, I can't believe I sent you guys to that Red Sox game alone that time. You were so young. I pretended not to know what she was talking about, that it didn't, cost, that it didn't cause lasting damage. I shrugged. We were fine. We made it home. The sin, though, was not loading me onto the bus with a gang of rowdy plumbers, but sending me into that world without an adequate education. I've told versions of the following tale many times, always embellished, and mostly to female Red Sox fans, whom I wanted to shame into adoring me. <laughs> when eight years ago I tried it on the woman who became my wife, she replied, that's total bullshit. <laughs> I don't know what version I told her, but I'm sure she was right. Uh, now I attempt to set the record straight, by explaining without exaggeration what I remember of that horrible day. I wore one of my many Red Sox t-shirts. This was my finest article of clothing, a practice jersey made of nylon of a nylon blend, navy except for the red lettering across the chest spelling out the team name, and the red trimming around the sleeves and the v-neck. Probably I put on blue jeans and sneakers. My outfit was incomplete without a hat. How could one go to a ball game without a cap? Although we were a working class family, I never suffered a lack of Boston sports team apparel. I did own a Red Sox hat to go with my several shirts. It was a conversation starter. The previous summer, when I was waiting for my mom outside a grocery store, a hunched over old man noticed my hat and asked if I liked the Red Sox. Yeah, I told him. Me too, he said, and I hate their guts. They're so far in the basement they look up and they're still looking down. <laughs> when I put the hat on before the game, though, I looked in the mirror and felt I'd gone overboard, that the combination of a Red Sox hat and shirt was too much. I, rep I replaced it with my youth team hat, but that also seemed wrong. I was going to a big league ball game. Did this occasion not call for a big league hat? You've realized already that I left our home that day wearing a Red Sox shirt and a Yankees hat. <laughs> that in this ensemble I boarded a bus full of already drunk New England plumbers. That the men who were supposed to watch out for my brother and I pretended not to know who we were. 
Some enormous thug picked on me all the way to and home from the game. He rambled, he rambled about how I would grow up to be the kind of guy who hid behind unions. <laughs> the beast pointed at my brother, not any Yankees hat, and said, he won't need no union. He spends his afternoons with one hand on his homework and the other hand on a titty. His plump forefinger pointed toward me. You probably haven't even figured out how to jerk off yet. This allegation put me in an awkward position. Defending myself would have been to insist, loud and proud, I jerk off all the time. <laughs> I just looked at my sneakers. The bus ride was much longer than its two hours. On the street outside the park, a man sold programs. In retrospect, he couldn't have been older than 20, but he bore the full authority of adulthood and more. He worked at Fenway. Programs here, get your programs here. Pro he stopped, jaw dropped, eyes raged. Take off that fucking Yankees hat. <laughs> I'd heard the F word before. At Dad's house, we rented videos filled with nothing but F words, and I'm sure he said it often himself. My mother generally managed to substitute friggin', as in, during a moment of desperation, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, please help me with these friggin' kids. <laughs> I was unprepared, though, for a stranger shouting the, word, the swear at me on the streets of Boston, surrounded by hundreds of other strangers. My cheeks burned and tears threatened, but there was also a strong chance I'd keel over in a fit of laughter. The guy had shouted fucking, as though it was nothing. I stopped walking. Did you hear that? I asked my brother. Come on, he said, grabbing my arm and leading me to the gate. He probably would have held my hand, being as sweet an older brother as one could ask for, except we both assumed, and perhaps correctly, that such an action would have provoked another shout from the program vendor. Look at the gabies! The Yankees fan is a little queer boy! Truthfully, the fat plumber on the bus and the vendor before the game amounted to the worst of the torment. The Red Sox did give away promotional calendars that day, yes. And yes, the man on one side of me did roll his into a ball and leave it in his fourth or fifth cup of beer. But I was not, despite claims I may have made in the past, pelted with beer-soaked calendars. The man next to me did not ring out his beer-soaked calendar over my Yankees head and head. Comments I could barely hear floated from the seats below ours. People craned their necks and pointed, talking about me. Confused kid, somebody said. All right. Um, Alex Harvey Gurr is in her first year of fiction concentration. Her guiltiest pleasure is eating raw cookie dough in bed. Her favorite sin is sloth, particularly by way of watching Netflix streaming. <laughs> her most interesting Valentine's Day was having her Valentine spend the day helping her edit stories about murder husbands and adulterous marriages. And you may not know that Alex is obsessed with Pokemon. Alex Harvey Gurr. I'm Alex, um, and I'm going to be reading two short chapters from a project I'm working on right now about obsession. The mic is always on. Talk louder? Yes. Yes. All right. Can everyone hear me? When Darla was 12. Okay, we'll put the mic on. There's nothing. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's tame. It's honest. <laughs> Sorry. There we go. When Darla was 12, a little girl from church fell into the White Tamata Harbor. It had been a sunny day with calm waves. Her daddy asleep with a fishing pole in his lap when the sea took her silently. They never found the little girl's body, just her right shoe that had escaped her fate and floated to the surface, bobbing in the waves with a kelp leaf caught in its laces half a kilometer away from where she drowned. They never found out how she'd fallen in without letting out a scream to wake up her daddy. The night Darla heard about the drowning, she dreamt that she was that girl, out in the harbor in a little red canoe dangling her feet over the edge. She dreamt a blade of kelp reached out from the deep and grabbed her ankle, pulling her down beneath the waves into the darkness trapping her forever in a slimy embrace. She had that dream for months. Darla never could remember that girl's name, even though she prayed for her soul every night for the next 40 years.
Darla's knuckles were white on the wheel of Bob's Monte Carlo as she maneuvered her way through the unfamiliar lanes of the 128 freeway through Massachusetts suburbs and countryside towards Eileen's Beach. Paper birches and maples clung to the sides of the freeway, each one drunkenly pointed out and named by Bob. Darla nodded each time he gestured towards one with his beer can, pretending to look when he told her to as she listened with half an ear to her husband and Eileen in the back seat, smoking a cigarette together and gossiping about people in the office Jim had never told her about. The car began to reek of cigarette smoke and the smuggled picnic beer, spilling over the side of the aluminum can lips onto the upholstery, cheap hoppy yeast seeping into the very framework of the car and making Darla so nauseated he had to whirl, she had to roll down the window. She prayed they would get there quickly. It took an hour for them to drive to Eileen's Beach, just north of Rockport. Jim and Eileen jumped from the car as soon as Darla parked. They ran towards the waves like children, tossing their clothes in the sand behind them like a bread trail of shirts, pants, and skirts for Darla to follow. She and Bob walked slowly after them across the hot dunes, the heat from the cooking sand creeping up her bare calves, making them feel like they were being baked like bread. The sand was rippled by the sea breeze, granular snakes molding beneath her feet. The sand was rippled by the sea breeze, granular snakes molding beneath her feet, sinking and spreading out with each step he took. Stray grains snuck into the crevices of her heels and pooled at her toes. Darla stopped at the line where the dry sand met the wet. The stench of salt and decomposing seaweed invaded her nostrils, making her stomach turn and her pulse quicken until she acclimated and forced back the adrenaline sprinting up and down her veins. She kicked off her heels and sat down carefully folding her dress hem beneath the backs of her knees so that a surprise gust of wind wouldn't carry it away. Bob sat with her, the last two beers of the twelfth back in hand, his side brushing lightly against her arm as she watched her husband. She watched him splash and hop around in the low tide in his underwear after Eileen, an eager little dog with a sagging beer gut chasing after a tree. She watched Eileen egg him on, pretending to run away, making sure she went slowly enough that he eventually caught her. Her long, salted red hair clung to her face like Medusa's ruby snakes, clung to her freckled skin, to her nude bra as she laughed that terrible, beautiful siren laugh of hers. Darla pushed her feet beneath the sand and let the fine grain sift silkily between her toes, grounding her as she watched her husband chase a younger woman through the waves in front of her. Mrs. E, Mrs. E, come on in, the water's great, Eileen called from the shoreline. Sun rays bounced off of the beads of salt water covering her arms as she waved them frantically to get Darla's attention, making her glitter on the horizon. Gotcha. Jim wrapped his arms around Eileen's wasp waist and nuzzled his nose into her wet hair, letting it curl around the loose flaps of skin beneath his chin. Don't bother, princess. Darla hates the water. Afraid the seaweed will get her. He laughed as he picked up a squealing Eileen and tossed them both into an oncoming wave. Darla felt Bob's eyes on her, but she refused to turn to meet them. He nudged the beer cans towards her. She shook her head and let the wind pick up her hair and make it dance in the sea air. She watched it fly around her face before it landed delicately on her chest. Darla looked at it. Fine blonde locks peppered with salt and sand. Her mother's hair. She felt the back of her throat begin to tighten and itch, wishing more than anything in the world in that moment that her hair was red. Hey, Mrs. E. Eileen laughed from the water as she surfaced. Take a picture of me and Jim? Bob has a camera in the glove box. Darla watched as the periphery of her vision darkened. Her head seemed detached from her body, like a balloon floating above the ground with an untethered line dangling just out of reach. She could feel every lump of sand that pressed against her calves, every sand flea that hopped on the tops of her ankles as they made their way home. Darla pulled her feet from the sand and rocked forward to stand. Bob's fingers snagged on the hem of her dress. Darla. She pulled away from his fingers and he let the hem fall to her knees. Darla walked barefoot to the car, leaving her heels behind in the sand. The black asphalt burned her feet as she opened the passenger door and yanked the camera out of the glove box by the neck strap. Tears pricked the corner of her eyes. She told herself it was from the pain of her burning feet. The hot sand nipped and sucked at her toes as she walked with steady steps back towards the beach letting the covered lens of the camera hit her rhythmically in the hip as she carried it haphazardly towards the water and her husband. As she crossed the threshold from dry sand onto wet, she wondered for a brief instant if there were any stray strands of kelp trickling out from the tide, and if they would want her. She passed Bob, and as she passed him, she picked up one of the beer cans with her free hand. 
Darla stopped five yards away from the edge of the surf. She flipped off the plastic cover and lifted the ends to her right eye. She didn't call out to Jim, but Eileen spun him around anyway and put her freckled arm around his shoulder. Eileen's green eyes smirked out at Darla through the spray of a wave crashing on the backs of their legs. The water crept up to Darla's feet, a discarded leaf of seaweed brushing against her ankle as she pushed down the button. Her fingertips shook on the smooth black plastic as she whispered into the tide. Smile. Well, thanks everybody for coming out on a Friday night. Um, if anybody wants to move up, there's a few seats here. I'd offer these chairs, but that might be a little awkward. Um, so our next student reader is Luke Flaherty. Luke is in his first year, fiction concentration. His guiltiest pleasure, please tell me if you're lying, is Courtney and Kim take New York. <laughs> um, chastity is his favorite virtue because he doesn't have to try very hard to succeed at it. <laughs> so there is a funny quote about lust and chastity. Um, this most recent Valentine's was Luke's most memorable because he had had a secret crush on a girl he met for the better part of senior year in college, and this year she was his Valentine. And you may not know that Luke is wearing a fake mustache, Luke Flaherty. Um, my girlfriend wrote all those, so... Testing, testing. All right, let's do this. <clears throat> so I'm doing a couple pieces on Vegas. And the first one is called, I think there's a ghost on the dance floor or the straight dope on straight dope. <clears throat> I met her amidst the sea of kaleidoscopic freaks, sexy clowns, and neon posers. There was a common grind that people had into one another. Not in the abrasive way you might feel it say, a regular rock show where an idiot hoists his girlfriend on his shoulders and blocks her view, or a 250 pound skinhead is yanking out clods of your hair every time he you swings your way in the mosh pit. No, no, this is nothing like that. In this grind, bodies float together amidst flashing beams of light that illuminate an arena for milliseconds at a time. In the confusion of the dance, I bumped into one of those freaks. I couldn't quite verbally communicate with her at the time. The music was far too loud and I was far too fucked up but our bodies had a magnetic way of understanding one another. I didn't come there to do drugs, I just came to dance. She, on the other hand, seemed to be on the roll of a lifetime. When I touched her, I could feel her entire body warp in, forgive the pun, ecstasy. It began in her head. She swung her bittersweet black hair, the vibration creeping down past the confines of her eyelids as droplets of sweat painted her profile. There, we danced in perfect synchronicity she, with the potent effects of MDMA surging in every kinetic movement, I, with a bloodstream composed about a fourth of alcohol. Then, the blackout came to a halt. We were interrupted by this lumbering man, a towering, carny demon hybrid who interfered with our dance. Seriously, this guy was like standing on fucking stilts or something. He leaned down towards us and began scolding us with his finger pointed. I'm not sure why he tried, as clearly no one could hear anything outside of the noise. But I know he must have been the only unhappy person in a crowd of 30,000 people dancing out of their minds. I try to cut free of the incident by throwing a casual thumbs up at the man and saying something like, cheers. That's when I realized I was no longer dancing with her, but standing there with this creepy fellow. She was gone. And the strobes struck the arena. The floor was flashing from pitch black to where you could only see with your hands and body to total illumination to where you could feel with your eyes all multiple times per second. I could vaguely see her out there, lost at sea, trying to leave. Or at least I thought I could. Beads that lit up the back of her neck asked me to follow from afar, a regular white rabbit leading me down the rabbit hole. Perhaps I was just seeing what I wanted to see, all of the neon blurring together against an impossible flickering of lights. I let my body do the work, maneuvering my way through the crowd, the lubrication of sweat acting as my catalyst, taking that leap of faith. I tracked her by instinct or luck. She was outside of the arena, but still within the confines of the venue. The impossibly large fountain and surrounding shallow pool was a popular spot for meltdowners, people far too fucked up on their own shit, far too inexperienced with MDMA, or what I'm sure is a frightening combination of both. 
The good thing about this area is that people often forget about their alcohol. I found myself sans whiskey by the time I reached her, so I decided to grab a couple of those half-empty Vegas-style canisters of cheap beer. She was sitting towards the edge of the fountain. This area was fairly quiet compared to the loud thumping we could still hear faintly inside that glowing arena. She sat against that low wall that dammed up the fountain, her head buried in her hands, legs crossed, reverting to what looked like a childlike state of panic. I tried to remember what it was to feel that terrible paranoia of my first bad experience on grass. Some years ago, when I was still in high school, I decided I wanted to get really fucked up on marijuana, and I did. Twenty-something minutes of smoking pure medicinal crack had me in a completely shattered state by the peak of the night, lost in a world of haunting video games and stuck in an existential psychosis. Nothing could ever be worse, I thought. I looked at Jane. Oh wait, yeah, it probably could. I tried to remember the state in order to empathize with her. I needed to save this girl from whatever demon she was going through pronto if I wanted to salvage the night. So I decided to chug one of my warm bottles of Miller Lite. Hage, I stumbled. Shit, what was her name? I followed her all this way without even getting a name. Hey, you, I said. <laughs> what happened back there? Please leave me alone, she said. She hardly moved. Wrong approach. I knew I needed a name. Uh, are you okay? Does it look like I'm okay? No, I guess not. Who are you, she asked. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, I never properly introduced myself. I'm Jake. I don't know any Jakes, she said. Can you please leave now? This wasn't going anywhere. I had to think quickly. What would Jesus do? <laughs> Say, you look like you could use a beer. She peered up from her shield of crossed elbows, stained with tears. As she looked at me, a slight smile appeared. Oh, hey, I know you. From in there, she said. Yep, it's me. How are you feeling? Ugh, she went back into her armor. Look, I said, I read once in a scientific magazine that if you down half a canister of warm Miller Lite during a drug freakout, all your bad vibes will turn into really good ones. Really? Yeah, really, it's science. <laughs> she extended her hand out to me, so I gave her the bottle and sat close to her. It took her a few gulps, but she got down the warm piss. Any better, I asked. Uh, I don't know yet. What was your name again? Jake. She inch inched closer to me and placed her head on my shoulder. It kind of felt like I'd known her for a long time. Her head seemed to fit perfectly between my shoulder and my neck. Hi, Jake. I'm Jane. We talked for a good while by that fountain. Her small hands clutching one of mine, the one that acted as her anchor, perhaps feeling that if she let go, she might start to go back to that lonely place. It was getting late or early, so I suggested we dance. I can't go back out there, she said. Why not? I can't lose control again. I just need to sit with you to talk. Here's the thing, I said. Often, in the worst moments in our life, they're completely out of our control. But sometimes, in our best moments, the ones we'll forget experiencing but remember as having happened, we're totally out of our minds. Was it working? I couldn't tell. She sat in silence, thinking about the comment. I sometimes have a way of making very bad ideas sound very good. Do you promise me you won't leave me, that you'll stick by my side all night, she asked? I promise. So we worked our way back towards the arena and back into the grind. The night became very blurry, very fast. I remember our bodies pressed up against one another in perfect unison with the rhythm of each other, the rhythm of the music, the rhythm of the lights. I remember our first kiss, wet from the perspiration that dripped down our lips and onto the mattress of my hotel suite. I remember her fingers gripping the back of my shoulders as she watched the sunrise for the first time. That's the end of the first piece. Um, the second is called Chiquita. <clears throat> and it's also about Vegas. I was puking my guts out in a strip club <laughs> toilet in Vegas to the point where the bastard wouldn't flush. I was thinking about the stripper who caused this mess when she poured down those cranberry vodka cocktails down my throat. She called herself Mandy, but her real name was Chiquita. Seriously. I don't understand why a stripper with the same name as a banana would feel the need to change it for an erotic performance. <laughs> Maybe it was meant to be ironic. Maybe she's kind of a hipster stripper, like Diablo Cody. <laughs> These thoughts ran through my mind as I clutched porcelain and wondered when some massive, angry Samoan bouncer was going to burst into my bathroom stall and kick my ass for being too drunk. Someone did burst in, but thankfully, it wasn't an angry Samoan. It was my brother, the same guy who one night ago, decided we should pack a few suits into a duffel bag and drive to Vegas. Great idea. It was when I finished vomiting that I realized the bathroom attendant 
had probably been horrified at the ghastly harmony of someone puking his brains out and what that would entail when it came time for him to clean up the mess. That, and I had no tip for him. Quick, I said to my brother, you gotta hide me. I don't have any money for a tip. Uh, I'm not really sure how I can do that, dude, you're 6'4". Quiet, I said, they might hear us. I flung my arm around his neck and he kicked open the door, immediately revealing our reflection in the bathroom mirror. The lights were low, and against those awful blood-red walls, it created kind of an amber effect, which did not do well for my newly acquired vampire complexion that made me look even more pale considering I was wearing a blacked out suit. After emptying my stomach of too much vodka and cranberry juice, I looked like Edward Cullen on crack. Of course, standing next to me, my brother looked immaculate in comparison, clean cut with a striped dress shirt and jeans. He pulled me along to the exit, and we approached the attendant. The only way I can describe his expression was as a combination of terror and bewilderment. All I could muster up was, I'm so sorry, so very, very sorry. We walked outside, and the heat was blistering. Not even the night air could stop it. The black Cadillac Escalade my brother ordered to drive us around the strip pulled up, and we stumbled in. I remember rolling down the window and hanging out of it as we drove through town, doing my best to emulate Heath Ledger's Oscar performance as the Joker in The Dark Knight. Our driver, our driver did not think the performance was so Oscar-worthy, and he kicked us out on the strip at Jimmy Buffett's Margaritaville. Outside, a vendor was selling those four-foot-high fruity drinks with the crazy straws, so I decided to grab one. Yeah. Hey, the Bellagio is only a block up. Let's go look at that fountain, I said. It'll be like Ocean's Eleven. Uh, only there's two of us, and instead of having just stolen $8 million, you just threw up in a cheap strip club off the strip, he said. Who do you want to be, George Clooney or Brad Pitt, I interjected. So we crawled up the strip on our way to see the giant fountains at the Bellagio. Trying to keep up with that city, built on madness and money and fueled by methamphetamines, me sipping on a strange looking drink, and my brother screaming profanities at passerbys, stumbling through a winding and wobbly stream of lights in the middle of the desert. Thank you. All right, our final student reader of tonight is Amy Longmire. Amy is in her last semester, nonfiction concentration, and her guiltiest pleasure is teaching women how to knit. Amy Longmire. Hi. Um, this is a true story. It happened recently. Um, it's called The Last Time I Flew, and it's not called The Last Time I Had the Flu, because they give you shots for that now. So, um, <laughs> Uh, and it's okay to make some noise. It's funny piece. Uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so this is about how uh, recently, over Thanksgiving weekend, my one of my brothers uh, coerced my entire family into going skydiving. Um, it was his gift to us. So, <laughs> and he's here tonight. Uh, so the last time I flew. Uh, this might sound ignorant, but I had no idea skydiving was such an organized sport. There's name brand gear and moves. I'd only pictured skydiving as really necessary in emergency situations. For example, when the plane I am in is suddenly about to crash and I am most certainly going to die if I stay in my seat. Thanksgiving weekend 2011, skydiving was my brother Tyler's way of saying happy birthday to our entire family all at once. It was hard to find that to be a gift at that point. Uh, I was paired to jump with a guy named Larry. He seemed arrogant and macho and talked as if jumping out of a plane was simple child's play. I remember thinking, this guy's really not my type. Uh, and I realized I didn't have to spend the rest of my life with him, but this might be the end for me. And I'd be strapped to a guy with a shaved head who laughs like a machine gun. <laughs> I quickly came to my senses. All I really needed at this moment was a guy who absolutely knows how to jump out of a plane, deploy our parachute, and get me to the ground safely. That's all. So I took the goggles he handed me, and I tried to listen to his instructions. But I stopped him pretty quickly. I'll be honest with you, Larry. Skydiving is not on my bucket list. You know what I mean? Actually, I don't plan on ever writing a bucket list because what happens when you check the last thing off your bucket list, right? So this will be better if you aren't waiting for me to actually jump. Uh, you'll have to shove me. And no funny business. No tricks, no flips. 
be gentle with me. It's my first time, and I'd really like to live. And Larry, I hope you have some good reasons to live, too. <laughs> like, okay, no problem. Larry's quickly, uh, uh, quickly <laughs> sizing me up. Uh, it's a great day for a jump. No wind, not a cloud in the sky. You really couldn't have asked for a better day. So let's go have some fun. But the plane ride is the worst part. It takes 10 minutes to arrive at 14,000 feet. 14,000. <laughs> this gives my entire family 10 minutes to rethink this most recent decision and our sanity. Uh, the plane is packed. It's both my parents, both my brothers, my sister, her husband, myself, and our tandem professional jumpers, who I decided look exactly like crash test dummies. <laughs> <laughs> We're instructed to sit directly across from our assigned person. And my brother Spencer is facing me at my left knee, and my brother Tyler, the one who talked us into this mess, is at my right knee. And Larry is directly in front of me. <laughs> And it was hard to hear anything over the plane's engine, and my ears were popping. And whenever Spencer would catch my eye, he'd mouth, are you OK? <laughs> are you is the only thing I could return. And whenever Tyler caught my eye, he'd give me this, this is going to be awesome. <laughs> I wanted to punch him in the face. Um, but my white knuckles were locked in a death grip to my own harness, and I could not let go of myself. Um, and the crash test dummies were laughing and joking about the group they'd just flown with. And I was trying hard to avoid the window, looking out the window as the afternoon sun was streaking through. And just when it seemed we had reached about as high as I could imagine, our crash test dummies looked at their altimeters and acted like it was time. So the rest of us sat up a little straighter and waited for instructions. And then they yelled, this is the halfway point, 7,000 feet. And they laugh. They think this is the funniest thing they've ever heard. And we look around and we take deep breaths. And our eyes are wide and our mouths are dry. And our hands are clammy. And my sister is cursing under her breath. As we climb higher, this plane seems to get louder and smaller. And it smells faintly of gasoline. But these crash test dummies know exactly how to maneuver the situation so that we never have a chance to chicken out. In one swift move, Larry has me sitting on his lap and is latching his harness to mine. The door of the plane opens and he tells me to put on my goggles. And there's this flurry of activity inside the plane with everyone being latched together and the cold wind rushing through us all. I saw my mom at the door of the plane one second and the next, she was gone. <laughs> and we just kept scooting down the line until I could feel the full cold force of the open door and the wide expanse of the horizon out in front of me. I swallowed hard. I closed my eyes while Larry counted. Uh, on one, we walked back. And before he had finished saying the word two, we were free falling. <laughs> and 150 miles per hour feels faster than anything I could have imagined. And I understand this now. Uh, it was hard to breathe. The wind was rushing past, pushing against my face my chest, my arms, every part of me. And for the 45 seconds of free fall, it felt like I was stuck under a wave and could no longer define up and down. I couldn't even feel Larry, who was latched to me. I'd expected to feel his weight push against me. But during free fall, I almost forgot he was there until he tapped me on the shoulder to remind me to spread my arms out so that he could pull our chute. But my hands were still locked <laughs> in a white knuckle deck death grip with my own harness, and this tiny last amount of letting go was terrifying. Uh, I already made it out of the plane. The only thing that could go wrong now is a failed parachute. But I took another shallow breath, and I lifted one finger at a time <laughs> until, uh, before spreading my arms out like Larry had showed me when we were safely on the ground and I was blissfully unaware of what 150 miles per hour feels like. With my arms spread like wings, I spent a few awkward seconds trying to reach for Larry's hand. <laughs> a moment of hold me panic. <laughs> but I couldn't reach him. So Larry pulled our chute, and we waited for it to open, which took forever. And I held my breath in anticipation. And I waited for my life to flash before my eyes, but there wasn't enough time. <laughs> How you doing? Larry spoke up as we finally heard her parachute. I'm trying to catch my breath. I could only get two words out at a time without feeling like I might pass out. 
just relax. We're right where we should be. Larry was doing his best to reassure me. He wanted me to have a good time. Oh, wow, was all I could manage. <laughs> he adjusted my harness slightly to make me more comfortable and continued talking. You're doing so good. We got lots of time. Oh, wow. It was still the only thing I had to offer. My ears were still plugged, but the air was getting warmer, and the blessed parachute was finally open, so all I could hear was the sound of my own shallow, gasping breaths. So, do you live here in San Diego? <laughs> <laughs> no, I live in Pasadena. The rest of my family <laughs> lives here, and we are all here jumping out of perfectly good planes today because my brother <laughs> thought this was a great idea. I think that's him over there, and this is all his fault. It seems no one in my family can say no to this guy. <laughs> I keep going. Uh, I've never had a reason to question his sanity before, but I think there might be something wrong with him. No offense, Larry. <laughs> There's no one named Larry here. <laughs> I heard Larry's machine gun laugh, and I felt his chest vibrate against my shoulder blades. He thought I was hilarious. <laughs> I only asked because it's such a clear, we have such a clear view of the border. See, there's Tijuana right there, he offered as soon as he could control himself. Oh, wow. And there's downtown San Diego, and there's, there's the ocean. It's beautiful, right? Oh, wow. I wasn't bringing much to this party. So how can you live in Pasadena? <laughs> I'm a writer and a grad student at USC. Oh, that's cool. I couldn't help but remember the last time I flew through the air. The last time I flew th through the air was 26 months earlier, and it was nothing like this. I was four steps into a crosswalk, and I was hit by a car. I flew out of my shoes. The last time I flew through the air, I was strapped to a backboard by an EMT who sat next to me in the ambulance and asked me very similar, very personal questions about my life. If you could do anything with your life, what would it be, he asked quickly. And shock was washing over me. I could not stop my teeth from chattering. I could not catch my breath. And I had this distinct feeling of being sucked under an insurmountable wave. Amy talked to me. What would you do? His shock was billowing in like a San Francisco fog, and it lasted at least eight weeks before dissipating and allowing the actual pain to set in. And I couldn't believe this was the conversation he wanted to have right now. My voice was small and it sounded very far away. I want to be a writer. I want to go to grad school. I want to write. That's cool. So you're one of those artist types. I bet you'll have some great stories to tell tomorrow. <laughs> I searched for his face and became painfully aware of just how tight my harness was. He backpedaled a bit. Maybe not tomorrow, but soon, definitely soon. Oh, wow. So Larry was asking me about my writing and offering to let me steer our parachute. I took the reins and we turned a few circles. I didn't realize that you could have this much control of ourselves while dangling thousands of feet in the air by some silky fabric and string. That's awesome, he said. I bet you're going to have a lot to write about this later. Oh, wow. Larry pointed out the landing strip. I could see our car in the parking lot, and my sister and her husband were both just about to touch the ground. We've got lots of time, Larry said, unknowingly reminding me of just how far I'd come in the last two years. Larry landed us safely in the exact spot where our plane had taken off 15 minutes earlier. My legs were wet noodles. My ears were still plugged. Larry unhooked us and stood me up on my feet. He put his big hands on my shoulders, and he turned me around to face him. Lived? Is that I asked, relieved to have finally found two words other than, oh, wow. Larry gave me a big hug, and he added, we did, and you did so great. Really? <laughs> really? You lived, and you did so great. Well, Larry, thank you, he said. Uh, Larry gave me one last high five before dashing off to reload his parachute and meet his next jumper. Joining the rest of my family, there were hugs and high fives all around. There were sighs of relief and raucous laughter and more pictures than we could count. We had done it and lived. Later, we made Spencer make a speech to mark the occasion. It mainly consisted of lines from the Braveheart speech, uh, the preamble, <laughs> preamble to the Constitution, and a little Teddy Roosevelt re-paraphrased. Some men are born skydivers, and other men have skydiving thrust upon them. <laughs> 
with, our, uh, with loud voices, our ears were still plugged, and shots of tequila, we toasted our victory. And while the guys talked about definitely doing this again, my mom and sister made plans to keep their feet on the ground for Christmas. And I was struck by the notion that I am always so afraid that the next time I fly will be my last. And how I only seem to have major epiphanies about my life while strapped to strange men when my life is in danger. <laughs> Thank you so much. Big thank you to all our student readers for reading tonight. All right, and now for our faculty reader, um, winner of the 2002 Pacificus Foundation Literary Prize for Achievement in Short Fiction, Gabrielle Pina is depicted as a poignant, masterful storyteller. Her novels have been described as ever suspenseful, Black Issues Book Review, a spectacular effort, written magazine, and certainly chasing after Oprah fans, Library Journal. She is a faculty member at the University of Southern California's Master of Professional Writing program, where she also received a um, master's degree and is an adjunct English professor at Pasadena City College, where she works in collaboration with the Ujima program. Though her innovative, uh, through her innovative curriculum, she addresses the devastating rate of failure among African American students on college campuses. In 2002, she was viewed as the writer to look out for when she published the highly acclaimed short story, Uncommon Revelations, for the ESI anthology, recently re-released by Amazon Shorts. That year also featured the birth of her thesis project, Bliss, into a novel, which culminated into a national book tour and three book deal with Random House. Pina's long-awaited sophomore novel, Chasing Sophia, was released in October and has become a book club favorite. She resides in Southern California with her husband, Ron, and her children, Julian, Maya, and Langston. Pina is currently at work on Letters from Zora in her own words, a play about the life of Zora Neale Hurston that will premiere this spring at the University of Southern California. She's also hard at work on her third novel, currently untitled, and the screenplay from her first novel, Bliss. Ladies and gentlemen, Gabrielle Pina. from my second novel, Chasing Sophia. There was a tornado watch issue for the entire state of Texas the day my mama went crazy. Our block on Haven Street was buzzing about the one, rotating its way through tornado alleys, stirring up all kinds of trouble. Showing out, that's what it was doing. Twisting and twirling like it was mad at somebody. My Aunt Baby said that tornado looked mighty hungry and intended to suck up homes until it was full and satisfied. See, she said, cars and trailer parks are only appetizers. This here tornado craves a five-course meal. The sky is talking up a storm today, Dahlia, and by the looks of it, we're all getting cursed the hell out. She leaned down and whispered into my ear, it's a bad one though, baby dog. I can feel it in my bones. The entire house always knew when a storm was brewing because some part of Aunt Baby's body would start aching. And on that day, she announced that all four of her corns were screaming bloody murder. <laughs> I was scared after she said that. And she tried her best to reassure me, calm my nerves. She promised me our house wasn't anywhere near the suck zone. And besides, didn't I know by now that tornadoes skipped over funeral parlors? Tornadoes only like fooling with live people. And we have way too many stiffs up yonder to interest that old twister. So don't worry, baby doll, she cooed. Don't worry. People don't usually name tornadoes, but that year daddy insisted. Dahlia, darling, he said, any twister that beautiful and that dangerous can only be female. Reminds me of a woman I used to know named Sophia. He laughed. Sophia, Sophia. His eyes twinkled when that name rolled off his tongue and his laughter that night was loud, full, and contagious. Aunt Baby opened every window in the house and turned off the electricity after we caught a glimpse of Miss Sophia on the news. She was mesmerizing and terrifying at the same time and as expected terrorized trailer parks up and down the Lone Star State. 
but you know. Despite Sophia's petulant disposition, I long to just run up to her and thrust my hand somewhere deep in the middle, introduce myself, make her acquaintance. To me, she resembled one of those peculiar Van Gogh paintings, except it's flying at you at 150 miles per hour. And all the while you think you comprehend what you're looking at until you're tempted to look a little closer. Anyway, while most of Dallas County was worried about being swept clean to Oklahoma, I was wondering if my mama was going to make it through another day without creating a catastrophe. She did. And now that I think about it, since you were forcing me to remember it, that morning began the same as any other. We had just decorated the house the night before for Christmas. Daddy had to stop twice to go set the features on two cases, you know, fix the eyes, cheekbones, basically make the non-viewable viewable. He possessed an extraordinary gift for such thing, restructuring dead people, recreating bone. He could transform just about anybody into someone acceptable to gawk at on a Sunday afternoon. People who weren't even related to the families would come to wake sometimes just to marvel at the artistry of my father's work. He probably should have been a surgeon, although I don't think that would have made his life any easier. You see, the phone never stopped ringing for him as it was. People seemed to be dying a lot that year, dropping like flies, ultimately ending up downstairs in my house cold and stiff, waiting to have their fluids flushed by my father. Oh, I'm sorry, you seem surprised. I can understand that. I mean, who would ever thought, guess how bizarre my upbringing was by just looking at me? And you want to know one of the things I remember the most? The clothes. You wouldn't believe the get up some people dressed their relatives in after they died ridiculous ensembles that would kill the dead all over again if they woke up and saw themselves. <laughs> anyway, Daddy was extremely busy that day. There was plenty of prep work to do because there were five bodies that had to be bathed, embalmed, and made up. Mercy Blue, the girl in charge of post-life makeovers, was wearing a tight red dress. Red was her favorite color. Go figure. And it was Tuesday because John Coltrane resonated from every corner of the house. Daddy always listened to train on Tuesdays. Daddy was in a manageable mood too, because Uncle Brother, that's what we always called him, was back from New Orleans. Daddy didn't like to admit it, but he depended on Uncle Brother to lighten his moods on the days when Mama was having one of her brain tantrums. Aunt Baby was on the other side of town mixing up some concoction for somebody. I can't recall exactly. I just remember that she wasn't there and if only she had been there. My mother was scurrying from one room to the next like a rat with a cat hot on its tail. She was a blur, a brown blur. You know, she always did that, zipped around from place to place as if her life was getting ready to end and she just had to complete one last task before her heart stopped beating. Haste was an ongoing obsession with her. Sometimes, I swear, she moved so quickly, she looked like she was gliding on air. Mama swore the earth would swallow her whole if she stood still for any length of time. Really, I'm completely serious. It's confounding, I know. Okay, let me clarify this madness for you. You see, if she was sitting on a chair with her feet up, that would be acceptable. But her legs could never touch the ground for more than a couple of minutes. Clearly my mother was, shall we say, not playing with the full deck. Or was four cans short of a six pack. How about missing two digits in her phone number? Bread was half baked, elevated, didn't rise all the way to the top. You get the picture. <laughs> she even propped her feet on a stool when she went to the bathroom. That being said, avoiding well-placed stools became something of a military exercise in my house. <laughs> we used to pretend like they were landmines, ready to blow us to kingdom come if we disturbed them and end. Jesus, she was crazy. Mama had those stools placed just so because she needed to be able to leap up on one in case the floor started to buckle and suck her ass under. My brother and sister and I navigated around them with extreme caution, but I said that, didn't I, already? You have to excuse my redundancy. I was 11. My brother was seven and my sister was three, I think. Anyway, my brother Jazz loved trains. He had this LGB train set that Aunt Baby ordered from a Sears catalog. He adored it. And much to everyone's dismay, usually played with it early in the mornings. The sound of the train annoyed me. So I went downstairs to check on Mama. Keeping an eye on Mama was my responsibility since I was the oldest. 
She looked and sounded almost normal that day, you know, like she used to. Good morning, baby doll. Help me get everybody dressed. I feel like going for a drive this morning. What about the tornado, Mama? You think I'm afraid of a little old tornado? Mama, they said on Channel 8 that Miss Sophia had a big fat core. I'm going to get to see a real live twister. Hush that talk now, you hear? We've got things to do, places to go. She was smiling, and she had combed her hair, and I swear to God I thought maybe we were going to Swenson's to get ice cream. She used to take me there and allow me to get two scoops of lemon custard, even though I always managed to drop the top one on the seat of our car. Jazz! Jazz! Stop fooling around with that train and get dressed. Mama said we're going somewhere. I rushed to get the baby ready. I was so excited at the prospect of having a normal mother again. And outside, Miss Sophia seemed like a distant relative. You know, if I close my eyes, I can still hear Train playing in my head, smooth and melodious. It was in a sentimental mood. Da 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 da. You know, the version he recorded with Duke Ellington. Baby doll, hurry up now, Mama whispered. We have to get out of here. This hell of a house doesn't want to let us go, and it'll die trying to hold us in. I was so giddy about wrapping my tongue around that damn sugar cone that I didn't remember to tell anyone that we were leaving. I didn't tell my father, and I was supposed to. You understand? It was my responsibility. Anyway, it was extremely windy outside, and I remember struggling a little to get into the car. It was a burgundy Mercedes with beige leather interior, and it smelled of strawberries and Chanel number no. five. I remember consoling my baby sister, Livia, because she couldn't quite figure out how to tie her shoes. I remember Uncle Brother running, sprinting out of the front door, and the urgency in his tone yelling for my mother to come back. Reva! Reva, come back here. Reva, do you hear me? Come back. Oh, and Jazz's sweet face. I remember Jazz's sweet face. I remember driving past Swenson's on Parker Avenue and feeling my stomach starting to swirl. I remember thinking that something was terribly wrong, and I remember now how normal Mama looked when she turned around and smiled. Hey, baby doll, she said. How about I take y'all to see a real live choo-choo train? Mm -hmm. readers, to Gabrielle, um, to our faculty for showing up, to everybody for showing up, um, to Roman, to Connie, to Damon who's filming, um, and look out for our next event, March 30th, um, Envy and Kindness at LACMA, uh, faculty reading by Judith Freeman, so I hope to see you there.